Our next speaker is going to be Manolis Kellis, who is a professor at MIT in computer science, and he's going to be talking to us about machine learning in genomics. It has been such a pleasure to meet so many uh, fellow alumni uh, here and uh, to hear so many people working on healthcare. Uh, you heard the statistics, 10 times more people die from preventable diseases than from car accidents and probably a thousand times more than from terrorism or other things that we tend to worry a lot about. So what can we do about that? Uh, for all of the, those who did not raise their hand on the healthcare uh, question, I think uh, that's a call for all of you guys to help us apply machine learning to healthcare and really make a huge impact for our children and for the elderly and for all of us. So what does my group do at MIT? So our group is to enable new therapeutics to really dissect the mechanism underlying complex traits using a combination of large-scale data generation and data mining in order to really transform healthcare into a rational science, to really understand what are all of these diseases that have all these weird names, as we heard about uh, in the panel, what are they truly biologically? Uh, and in my view, the same way that molecular biology unified the field of zoology and botanology, et cetera, by focusing on the DNA. What we do in my group is focus on the molecular mechanism. How are things changing at the single cell level? And how is that teaching us really how to understand disease in a completely unprecedented new way? And the basic tool that we're starting with is genetics. Why genetics? Because genetics gives you causality. It's not that what we're gonna go after is these small effect variants, no. It's that these small effect variants will teach us about the mechanism that applies to everyone in this room for every one of these disorders. So we're starting with genetic regions, and then what we're trying to understand is how are these genetic variants truly acting? And if we can understand these mechanisms, if we can understand the way that these genetic variants are acting, then we will be able to develop therapeutics in a next generation in a, in a way that truly transforms our uh, healthcare system as we know it. The challenge, however, is that if you look at these common genetic variants that underlie the vast majority of complex traits, in 93% of cases, they do not affect the proteins directly. What they do instead is that they affect, in a very subtle way, the circuitry of one of the hundreds of cell types that we have in the body where a nearby gene or a faraway gene may be expressed. That makes it extremely difficult to, to understand the underlying mechanism. If you look in this slide, at the top, what you see reigning supreme among all other causes of obesity is the FTO locus. And underneath what you see is that 89 common variants in this region are all falling the first intron of this FTO gene. More than a billion dollars was spent trying to understand what the FTO gene does. It turned out to be a red herring. The true target gene that we discovered in my group are 1.2 million nucleotides away. And when we modulated those other genes, we found that we completely could reverse the cellular mechanism of obesity and also at the organismal level to have a two-fold reduction in body weight by intervening both in human studies at the cellular level and in mouse studies at the organismal level. So the effect can be truly transformative. And how do we do that? We start with genetics and then we gather massive, massive data sets at the molecular level and at the cellular level of gene expression, of regulatory region function using epigenomics. And we do that in hundreds of individuals for each trait, both in healthy individuals and in control individuals. And by studying how these differences relate to the genetics of these individuals, we are able to understand the underlying mechanism. That's where the machine learning comes in. That's where the data integration comes in. So first, start with genetics, data generation, data integration, and that's where the models will then be validated experimentally. We take this very seriously. We don't just generate models and put them out there. We actually take the time to validate these models experimentally in our own lab. What this results in is a circuitry underlying every locus in the genome. So for thousands of loci, for 30,000 loci, what we have done is painted a picture like this that basically says what cell type and tissue are the genetic effects acting in, who are the downstream genes, who are the upstream regulators, what are the regulatory circuitry regions that they are acting in. 
In the case of FTO, this was transformative. It basically told us that the gene itself that the ge genetic variants are sitting in does not have any role in obesity. And instead, the true targets are IRX3 and IRX5 that you see in this slide. These genes were previously unrelated to obesity. We found out that they are the master regulators of a metabolic switch that switches your fat cells from storing energy into white fat cells into lipids or burning energy into beige and brown fat cells into calories being burned out as heat and dissipated away. We were able to then manipulate the circuitry, both in the upstream regulator and in the downstream target genes. And we were able to use that to, and also change the single nucleotide variant. I mean, that's precision medicine right there. Out of three billion nucleotides in the human genome, we chose one nucleotide that we could edit using CRISPR-Cas9 in primary cells from adipocytes of risk individuals. And we were able to show that we could completely, with a single nucleotide change, change the cellular signature of obesity. These cells that were previously unable to burn calories were now burning calories like the normal cells with a single nucleotide change. And then when we went into mice, we basically found that by knocking down one of these genes, IRX3, we were able to completely change the metabolism of these mice without changing their appetite, without changing their exercise. They were just simply burning more calories when they were awake and when they were sleeping. So this is the approach that we're taking. And what I'm going to describe, describe now is a series of vignettes for how do we scale this up to the whole genome. So first, we were basically building reference epigenomes across hundreds of cell types using a large number of cellular assays to map the activity of every gene and every control region in hundreds of cell types. We now have 823 cell types that we have mapped, enabling us to map 30,000 different regions associated with disease. We then take these uh, genetic variants associated with a large number of complex traits. In the last iteration, we've done this for 927 different traits. And what, we've, what we do is basically ask, are these genetic variants systematically localizing in regulatory control regions that are active in specific tissues? When that's the case, we can then predict systematically where are these diseases acting. And in many cases, they point to exactly the tissue we would expect. In the case of Alzheimer's, we were surprised. We were expecting them to point to the brain. They were not pointing to the brain. And the reason is that our brain samples were primarily neurons. They were instead pointing to CD14 plus immune cells. This is the signature of macrophages in the circulating blood and microglia inside our brains. These are the resident immune cells of the brain. So that basically told us that Alzheimer's is primarily an immune disorder of the immune cells of the brain. And only secondarily do you actually see an effect in neurons. And in longitudinal studies of where does the effect st start first and where does it go later, we find that indeed immune cells are affected first and neurons are only affected later. We, in addition to profiling these reference epigenomes, we're also profiling the variation across individuals, not just in genetics, but also in all of these intermediate phenotypes to basically figure out what are the tissues, what are the genes, what are the regulatory control regions, and what are the intermediate endophenotypes that are affected by the disease. And that is enabling us to paint a path of causality for how is the disease manifesting. This is, of course, very challenging because many of these intermediate variables might be a consequence of the disease or a consequence of the body fighting the disease. So we need to develop new statistical models to infer causality and to understand the mediation of the genetic effects through these intermediate variables. We've applied this very broadly. Uh, one example is in looking at methylation and gene expression in the case of Alzheimer's using post-mortem brain samples across more than 1,000 individuals that have been longitudinally profiled for more than 10 years. So in this particular case, we're looking at the epigenome and the transcriptome of these individuals, and then asking, can I predict these intermediate phenotypes from genetics alone? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. If I know your genetics at birth, I can predict what your brain epigenome will look like in 50,000 different regions at 93 years of age. That's a big deal. Why? Because we can then correlate those methylation changes with disease statues and then predict these disease changes at birth. So we're doing that systematically to basically both discover new regions associated with Alzheimer's disease, 
but to also help elucidate existing regions. This leads to hundreds of loci across the genome that are vastly expanding the set of 27 loci that are known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease genetically to 206 loci, giving us both the directionality of the effect and the gene underlying these changes in each of those cases. But up until now, I've only told you about bulk samples. The next thing we did is basically go beyond just a bulk brain sample to start looking at a single cell view of the human brain, given the complexity of cell types that are involved between excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, microglia, and many other cell types in the brain. So what we're doing systematically now in my lab is looking at more than a dozen different psychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders, which are major causes of death in the US, and looking at hundreds of individuals in each case, both cases and controls, and then understanding what are the cellular changes that are happening at each major cell type in the brain. We're doing this across multiple regions, and in many cases across both the epigenome and the transcriptome. This is basically leading to an unprecedented level of detail with which we can understand the human brain. We're now able to map where is every single cell falling in this continuum of activity patterns. The first dimension along which these 80,000 cells from 48 individuals cluster is the cell type. But within these cell types, we're basically finding that there are major subclusters of cells that are emerging. And those subclusters correlate very greatly with pathology. In each of the major cell types, excitatory, inhibitory, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, OPCs, microglia, we're finding that there are two major clusters that emerge. The first is associated with disease. The second is associated with healthy individuals. That basically says that after the onset of disease, no matter what the cause is, you're finding that every major cell type shows dramatic changes. We can exploit this to now start understanding differences between individuals. The first thing that we noted is that female individuals had a huge overabundance of these sick cells. Even though they were matched to men in our cohort for both the cognitive and the tissue level pathology. So that basically means both that women have it much worse off, that they have many more sick cells, but also that women are much more resilient than the men. So with the same amount of cellular pathology, they're able to tolerate it much, much more without symptoms. We're also able to expand this across hundreds of individuals at the single cell level. And what we're finding is changes in cell type abundance that correlate with pathology. As amyloid, a main signature of Alzheimer's increases, the fraction of excitatory neurons decreases and the fraction of astrocytes increases. And the opposite is seen for cognition. Individuals with more excitatory neurons show higher cognition and those with fewer astrocytes show higher cognition. So that basically says that across these hundreds of individuals, we can see patterns emerging that are very indicative of pathology at the single cell level. We're finding this is dramatically altered between AD and non-AD individuals, and this is dramatically altered with age. As individuals age from 80 to 90 to 100 to more than 100, with the fraction of neurons is dropping dramatically, and there are genetic causes to the fraction of neurons. There are genetic variants in the genome that determine whether you will have a higher or a lower fraction of excitatory neurons, and that in turn will determine your resilience to Alzheimer's disease. We're also looking at biomarkers, both in the blood and in exosomes and in the plasma for multiple of these late onset, uh, hard to profile disorders, including both Alzheimer's and cancer. We're able to now predict who has Alzheimer's and who does not simply using the blood by looking at epigenomic changes, specifically in macrophages in the blood. And this is basically giving us very good prediction. We're also able to predict biological age and correlate that with chronological age. And we can find individuals who age faster or slower. And these biomarkers of aging are enabling us to now recognize that in fact, APOE4, which is the main contributor to genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, is an independent contributor to this faster ager phenotype. And when we put the two together, we can predict Alzheimer's disease in a vastly superior way than using genetics or any other phenotype alone. That basically this faster aging rate is in fact a major, major uh, risk uh, for Alzheimer's. 
But all of what I've said so far treats Alzheimer's as a monolithic phenotype. Instead, Alzheimer's is defined by multiple signatures, neuritic plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, uh, the neuroinflammation. And when we start dissecting the regions of the genome that are associated with each of these intermediate phenotypes of Alzheimer's, we're finding that they paint a very multifactorial picture. They basically show that specific combinations of phenotypes paint different regions in the genome, and these regions are active in different cell types. Some are playing immune role, other are, others are acting in embryonic stages, others are acting in the fetal brain, others are acting in the adult brain, and so on and so forth. And the corresponding genes nearby these regions are also playing roles in very diverse pathways. That basically tells us stop treating disease as a monolithic phenotype, as we heard in the panel earlier. And this is what we've done. We've basically started integrating systematically the clinical record across millions of individuals to start defining clusters of comorbidity patterns that are occurring in the same set of individuals. This could be done simply using ICD-9 billing codes, but instead we're using a multimodal approach that's basically looking at prescriptions, at the lab tests, at you know, DRG and ICD-9 codes, and also at the handwriting of the doctor notes. And what we're finding is that together, these multimodal phenotypes are painting a much more complete and much more accurate picture of disease. We're able to now couple that with what are the cell types where these gene expression and enhancer changes are occurring, and therefore start understanding for each combination of phenotypes, where is the underlying pathology manifesting itself? Is it in the brain, is it in the blood, and so on and so forth? In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, this basically points to the blood as a major contributor as to whether you will actually experience PTSD after trauma or not. And indeed, there is literature that indicates that the history of infections can have a big role there, possibly again implicating immune cells. We're also tracking individuals longitudinally, in this particular case in metastatic melanoma, across several years of treatment to basically understand how are these phenotypes changing and how do they relate to specific clones living within the individual. And we're now expanding this across hundreds of individuals, both pre- and post-treatment at the single cell level. Lastly, we've developed uh, a new way of sharing data. We basically found across these many years of research that data was being siloed across many different hospitals. So we have a startup called SAIL for Secure AI Labs that's basically developing uh, both uh, computationally and at the hardware level uh, this uh, federated learning, enabling both machine learning models developed by different labs to be run on the secure machine and uh, patient databases to live in different hospitals in a separated, scattered way to enable learning across all of these different sites. The last thing we're doing is basically validating these predictions systematically. I showed you one example with the FTO locus. We are now moving to systematic programmable constructs that we are able to start with induced pluripotent cell, stem cells and then differentiate those two different cell types relevant to the disease and then use that to understand where is every perturbation manifesting itself. When we perturb distal regulatory elements, proximal regulatory elements, individual SNPs or the downstream target genes, where uh, are they acting in different regions of the brain, for example. And we're able to do these experiments now in multiplex 384 wells, one exper I mean 384 experiments at a time, enabling us to now start studying uh, how uh, all of these are uh, enabling us to now develop individual targets and understand how perturbing these targets affects synaptic density, calcium um, signaling, neuron fi neuronal firing rate, and so on and so forth. Uh, in collaboration with my former postdoc, Andreas Fenning, who's now a professor at TMU, we're now implanting these uh, multiplexed assays, 10,000 variations at a time, into the m uh, brains of mice to basically understand how these changes, again, are manifesting in different cell types. So what I've showed you so far is basically how we build the reference epigenomes to dissect the disease-relevant tissues and regulators, how we can combine genetic, epigenetic, and expression variation in the context of disease to understand causal genes, how we can apply all of that at the single cell level, how we can use both blood and brain biomarkers of disease and aging, and how we can integrate this information across many phenotypes, and lastly, how we can dissect the underlying predictive models uh, at the uh, circuitry level.
This is in collaboration with an incredible set of individuals. Many of those have gone off to start their own faculty uh, jobs and their own labs elsewhere. Uh, so we're looking for new postdocs. If you guys want to retrain, uh, join in, uh, come to MIT. Uh, great time for change of career. I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Thank you.